So there's a lot of you. So uh, despite the fact that I'm using the Go Present tool, I made the fonts bigger. So like you said, uh, my name is Richard, and this is how you get a hold of me on the internet. Um, this is actually my vacation, because Monday I start working at Slack on the communications tool you guys should all be using at work. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about web services and Go. And I thought it would probably be good to start by getting a common definition for all of this. So I hope you agree, but at least for the purposes of this talk, a web service we're going to think of as a set of data and some operations that we can perform on that data. And it's going to be accessed over the network using the HTTP protocol. Otherwise, it's not a web anything. And, uh, and the, the requests and responses that we make and that we receive are going to be structured and understandable by machines so they can take action on our behalf. Otherwise, it's a, it's a web application, not really a web service. So in Go, I thought we'd start here. Uh, Rob handled every Hello World example ever, so we're going to skip straight to Hello Dub Dub Dub, where our main function sets up a handler for slash, the root URL, and, uh, and it gives it this function literal with the signature response writer and request pointer from the HTTP package. And all it does is it takes that, uh, that response writer and sends hello dub 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 to it. So right away we can see that that implements the IO writer interface, which is important, because we can pass it to func.fprintline. And, uh, and so this listens on AD80 and is utterly boring in every other way. I want to focus in on this, this one function signature, though, this response writer and request pointer. It's a, it's a destination and source kind of thing, which you see all over the place in, in IO copy, in uh, well, IO copy is at least good enough. And by itself, it doesn't look terribly special. And when it's in a function literal, it really doesn't look special. But if you put it in an interface, it starts to take on a little more meaning. So this is the handler interface from the standard library, from the HTTP package. And sure enough, there's one method, and this is important because these are the kind of interfaces that we can really reuse. One method called serve HTTP that has that same signature, response writer, request pointer. This is the absolute lowest common denominator for a Go web service, for a Go web anything. And uh, the rest of this talk is really to encourage you to embrace that, to, to use it to its fullest possible extent. And, uh, and so the first step to that is rewriting our dumb hello dub 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 example to use the actual interface. So I named a type. It's an empty type. It's a boring type. And I defined the serve HTTP method with the same basic structure as we had before. And I've added a couple of things just to show the the full extent of the interface. We set the content type header. This is plain text, so it's text plain. And we're explicitly responding 200 now. And that's great. We're still saying hello dub dub dub. And, and that's not a web service, because that's not really very structured data. That's, that's just bytes. So let's rewrite this thing to respond with JSON, because that's, of course, that's basically what we do these days. So the content type, of course, changes. Now it's application JSON. It's still 200, because everything's OK. And now we're going, to be, we're going to build up this JSON encoder shenanigans. And a, a JSON encoder wraps around any old writer. So of course, our response writer will do the trick. And now we get to encode some arbitrary object, like my response, which I just made up. The problem is that you can have errors in this scenario. And, and they may not be very common errors, but if Go's taught us anything, it's that errors should be handled front and center as if we expect them to happen all the time. So that makes this a lot more verbose. It makes it something that you don't really want to do for every single route in your, uh, in your web application or your web service. And uh, so we have a problem. But we also have another problem, which is introduced by this error. Because if I rewrite the, the basic, you know, just hello dub 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 handler to be more like an error, at least in the HTTP sense, it doesn't actually look any different than what we had before. And errors should be noticeable. They should be. They should be unique. They should have a code path all their own. And, uh, and in Go, they should have an actual error value, right? So this is a bit dissatisfying to me. And this is something that, in combination with the verbosity and the annoyance of having to deal with the JSON encoder, means we need to, within the context of this handler, step up our abstraction just a little bit. So the errors that we want to get to are something like this, where we have functions that return errors. And if those errors are not nil, we have a problem and we should behave a little bit differently. And we're forced to handle these errors at every step of the way and make the best decision we can about how to deal with them. And, and that's, that's fantastic because as the, the author of some function or some library 
The error is our opportunity to communicate what happened back to the caller. And maybe what they wanted to happen happened, and that's, that's the nil error case, right? But maybe something entirely unexpected happened, and, and we want to have an opportunity to communicate that. And it's great that there's literally almost always that opportunity. So we want to extend that into our web services, too. So to combine the two things, the, the desire to make the JSON stuff a little easier and the desire to report errors in a very Go-like way, I, uh, I made this, this wrapper function called marshaled. And what marshaled returns is just a handler. It's the plain old, same old handler you've seen before. But there's this new function signature inside that has more detailed parameters, and it allows us to do some higher level things. First and foremost, it has the my request and my response types going on here. So we don't have to deal with the, the messiness of JSON directly. We deal with Go objects. And the JSON encoder down underneath handles that stuff for us. We also get to return an error, which means we can act like a normal Go function and the world's going to be the same. So since we're wrapping all of this stuff up and we're still producing a handler, we have the opportunity in this sort of framework level code to deal with bad requests and, and not acceptable requests and unsupported media types and all sorts of other things that make, just by default, make us better HTTP citizens. So underneath it works kind of like this. Uh, when, when this is called, which is sort of at early runtime, it's when you're setting up the routes and the, the different endpoints in your system, we look at the, the function signature there through the reflect package and determine that it has the right rough shape while me making a little hole for any old type we feel like where my request and my response are. So you can have your own custom types there. And, uh, and as long as the function's shaped roughly the right way, it's all going to work. So then at request time, we can use that reflected type to create an object of that type, let the JSON be decoded into it, and then call the function again using reflection to actually give you the nice statically typed interface that you're after. It's easier on the way out because the JSON uh, or encoder takes an empty interface and it'll happily do pretty much anything you want. This also gives us an opportunity to deal with errors, like in the Go sense, in a very HTTP natural sort of way. So when you happen to have an error come back from that, if it's non-nil, then we go into this write JSON error branch of the code where we do a constant type of application JSON we set a status code based on how the error looks to us. We set a JSON body that has an error, which is a machine-readable value, and a description, which is a more human-readable value. And you can see we pull the description just from the error stringified version so that uh, you have the opportunity to put in things like which file name you couldn't access or which network connection broke down. Um, and, and the error, if it implements these, these extra optional interfaces, has the opportunity to control the rest of the machine-readable parts of it. So you can override with the status code method what the, the actual HTTP response code is. And with the name method, you can override that machine-readable thing so you're not leaking Go types out into the world. Or maybe you have something a little different that you want to expose to people. But with these bridges, if you, if you add these to your, your Go programs that are using errors and turning them into HTTP responses, you can communicate with an HTTP, HTTP client just the same way you would a Go client. Everybody gets the same fundamental amount of information and can make the same determinations of how to handle those errors. So altogether, at this point, we can read and write JSON, request and responses flow without a lot of headache. We can respond with errors, and it works just the same way. But at this point, we only have one endpoint in our whole API, and that's, uh, depending on who you talk to, either useless or microservices. So the answer to getting from this one to bunches, to, to huge web services like most people end up implementing, is it's handlers all the way up. It's turtles all the way down. It's handlers all the way up. So you, you have handlers that just dispatch requests to other handlers. And they don't have to do anything particularly exciting. They just have to shunt off the work to someone else. You know, so you can mix up handling static content with multiplexers, with JSON, with HTML. And it, it's all just handlers. So, Let's start with request multiplexing. Um, the standard library comes with servmux, which gets the job done for a lot of folks. It's a prefix router that says slash foo goes over here, slash bar goes over here. And you can build that up arbitrarily as you want. 
but it's, it's lacking in expressiveness for some of the things that we want to do. So let's see if we can do a little bit differently ourselves. Um, fundamentally, what we're after here is a function that's like this. It's a, still a handler. It still has a serve HTTP method with the same old parameters. And we're going to inspect the URL field on the request and get the path field off of that. And in this, this case, we're just saying foo over here, bar over here, different handlers, and everyone's happy. But of course, this is not a terribly scalable thing to do, and it's in fact stupid. So we, we program it a little bit more abstractly, and we build a tree, a, a try, in fact, that we split the components of the URL path into individual pieces, and we walk down a tree of these handlers to find the, the ultimate root that we're after. So we go down the tree from you know, slash foo, slash bar, slash baz, and finally we look at the, the method so that we can have different handlers for get and post and all that sort of thing. And at the, the final end leaf of the tree, we find an HTTP handler, and that's what we actually dispatch the request to. And it's, it's simply a matter of recursion. So we look for successive elements of the path. If we don't find one, it's a 404. If we find one but we don't find the right method, it's a 405. And if we find one and we've got the right method and everything's happy, then we simply hand off the request to that handler. No big deal. So we can augment this, and this is where it gets more interesting than the, def the default serve mux. We can augment this to support wildcards. So we can have a particular part of the URL that can be anything you like, and it's still going to make its way down the tree. So when you do this, uh, that bit that gets extracted, that bit that's the wildcard, we can put that onto the query component of the URL alongside any other get parameters that you have, which sort of makes sense because that's effectively what it is. It's just uh, visually, it's embedded in the URL. So it looks like this when you use it. You know, the boring foo and bar idea is just very simple, handle func calls, uh, but you can do more by enclosing things in braces and that's going to be a, a parameter that gets abstracted out. So once again, let's recap. We've got our JSON in and out. We've got our errors. Now we have a lot of routes. So we, have, we can do a lot of things with our web services. And that means we're going to come head on with the problem of repeating ourselves. Because every one of those things in your web service probably needs to be authorized, probably needs to check rate limits, probably needs to do 15 other things that you have to share at some level. And so, of course, now we're getting into the territory where we're going to compose handlers in a more generic sense, not just for, for routing, but for any number of things. And so we think about it from the bottom up, from, from very primitive components like a rate limiter, and you wrap handlers in each other to build out the functionality that you ultimately want. So step one, let's build a, a middleware chain, like you might see in Django or Rails or, or some crazy Node.js thing, where the idea is you have a list of handlers, and you call them in order until somebody responds. And the first person to respond has won. It's not really a race because they go in order. But as long as these handlers don't respond, they're saying, go ahead and let the next guy do it. And so you can do things like enforce rate limit, where if you've exceeded your rate limit, we respond 400, and the request is done. If you pass that because it doesn't respond, then you can check your authorization and, and check headers to make sure that your tokens are correct. And if those are correct, again, you, you return a nil error and everything's fine. If you return an error there, maybe it's you know, 401 and the request is done. And finally, you get to the point where you do actual work. And when you have that do actual work handler, you don't have to worry about, am I authorized? Have I exceeded my rate limit? Are all the other things dealt with? You, you know that that's already been done because of the composition of these handlers. So, we implement this by overriding the response writer, which is an interface, which is a hugely important thing. Um, and we simply augment it with a written Boolean. And the first time you call write header, that, that becomes true. And that will kill the loop. So as the handler that's dispatching to these in sequence calls through, it's, it's checking it until written is true. And as soon as it is, we're done. We can turn this uh, rather tedious thing, this middleware chaining, into something a little more directly useful by building conditionals. So we can conditionally handle a request. Say, if a function returns a nil error, go ahead and allow the request on to this protected handler. But if it, re re if it returns an error, like the, the forbidden here in this example, then you return that error, you don't call the protected handler, 
crisis has been averted. And it's a natural step from here up to, say, HTTP basic auth, where the question becomes not, is this request valid, but is this username and password pair valid? So you can build these higher and higher abstractions that are fundamentally just handlers, wrapping handlers, wrapping handlers. And of course, every single one of them is a handler, and so it can be plugged in at absolutely any point in the tree here. So then there's another whole realm of web services. You know, what we've covered so far effectively is the functionality portion of building a web service. The other very important part of running something in production is visibility into how well it's working. And, uh, and that usually takes two forms, logs and metrics. And we can take the same approach with both of these, these fundamental things that we need our services to do by making handlers out of them. So first we'll handle logging. Um, you can build a very simple sort of wrapper for any handler that will call that handler and log it. And, uh, and so the implementation of all these, these logging primitives is basically the same as our middleware chaining. We're going to override the uh, response writer with something that implements the interface. Only when we write to this response writer, when we're supposed to write to the client, we're actually going to tee it off in two directions. First, it's going to go to the client. That's our first priority. Then it's also going to go into a buffer that we're holding onto until the end of the request. Once that's all done, we can take that buffer and the, the response code and all that stuff that's tied up on the response writer, and we can code that up in, in some JSON format and send it to Logstash, store it in S3, do whatever it is we do with our logs so that we have all that forever. And nothing about the handler that we've written that does real work has to know anything about the fact that it's being logged in any of the many formats that you can dream up. Likewise, with, uh, with metrics, it's sort of even an, an easier problem because you have a handler that needs to call a handler and increment a metric. So here's two of them because they fit on half a slide. A counter just calls a handler and counts that it did it. A timer starts a timer, calls the handler, and stops the timer. And that's it. And so these handlers are effectively interchangeable with what we've been using before, but now they have go metrics hum hung off the side of them and can send data to graphite and tell you how fast your stuff is. And you can make higher level things out of this too. You don't have to just count it. You can actually do the same deal with overriding the response writer and count by the status of the request or, or the status class or the number of bytes in the response. So you, know, you can keep 99th percentile latency for every request that responded with more than one megabyte of data. I don't know why, but you could. So now we've got visibility and we've got features. We've built a real web service. Um, and now I, I wanted to jump a little bit bit back into the, where it fits into the Go libraries. So who calls the first handler? Where, where does the root of this tree that we've built up actually happen? And the answer is the HTTP server. The, the thing that handles keep alive connections and TLS and uh, Go routines and any number of other things that basically reads a request off the wire and turns it into that request pointer that we've been using this whole time and then passes it to the handler. And there's one handler that's configured on, on an HTTP server. That's the one that gets called, and its responsibility is to get those requests down to everybody else that might care about it. And, uh, and in, so in Go 1.2, a lot of work, or I should say until Go 1.2, a lot of work has gone in off on the side with people trying to make these, these servers stop gracefully. And so you, do, you see a lot of techniques like overriding the net listener and the net con to add a, a sync weight group into the mix to inject connection close headers at just the right moment. And, uh, and all these techniques got very close. But there was, there was always fundamentally a trade-off between safety and liveness in these sort of hacks, where you either had to choose that our system is going to wait arbitrarily long amount of time to stop gracefully to make sure that absolutely every potentially in-flight request has been handled. Or you can choose liveness and say, we're going to give you a, a one second or a five second or a half second buffer to make sure that everything that's in flight is done, and then we're just going to kill off the keep alive connections. And that can, that can all work, um, but in Go 1.3, there's a couple things that are added to the server that make this much more correct. So the first one is called constate, which is, which is a callback you can add to the server. And the other one is a function called set keep alives enabled, which you can say false to. And the, the, that function really just wraps up the, the connection close injection stuff in a lot, uh, a lot safer easier to use way. So here's how it would work. 
you, um, you set up this constate callback, which receives a connection and this, uh, this const, the, which is what the state is. And effectively, when a, a request comes in for the first time, it gets a new connection. So that, that connection enters the new state. We add it to our wait group. It does some, some work. Maybe it, it becomes idle. So it goes on to a set of idle connections. And if it becomes active again, it gets bumped out of that set. And fundamentally, you, know, you can bounce into that, in and out of that set as often as you want for as long as you want until finally your connection is closed or hijacked and, uh, and we remove you from the wait group. So using this, this sort of knowledge of the world that we now have access to that's now exported in a useful way, we can stop gracefully by adding a close method to a server which uh, at first it, it starts sending those connection close headers to proactively kill stuff off. Then it closes all the listeners so we don't accept any more connections. Then we add a, a, a grace period, so to speak, for all those idle keep alive connections where now we, we actually know which connections they are so we can set a read deadline on them and give them another half a second to actually get a request in the door. Otherwise, we're going to kill them. And then finally, we can wait on that wait group. And that means that everybody in flight, even those keep alives that are going to maybe sit there forever, but instead it's just half a second, will ultimately die off and we have kind of an SLA on how long it's going to take us to gracefully stop. So I'm very much looking forward to having this available uh, because it's going to make everybody a lot safer. So at this point, let's recap once more. We can read and write JSON. Great. We can respond with an error, and it works the same way. And we have a well-formatted way to expose those errors up from, from GoLand out to our clients. We can multiplex as many handlers as we want to to have enormous, crazy large web services that do thousands of amazing things. And we can compose functionality so even though that request, uh, th those handlers are hugely numerous, all the shared functionality that can possibly be shared is shared. And finally, we can stop gracefully so we're not rude to our clients. And, uh, and so that's really, that's pretty good, I think. So what I, what I hope here is that the plea to use HTTP handler to really embrace that interface, just like the Go community embraces IO readers and writers, I hope that you'll consider this the building block for all the web stuff that you do. And that whatever abstractions you provide, however high up you go, however uh, cerebral you get with it, you provide those within the confines of the handler and not you know, just one big handler for all of your application. Um, that'll allow you to compose functionality in a nice orderly fashion and, uh, and gives you an opportunity to keep track of errors and, and recognize that they're going to happen on a network service and sh so we should all be prepared to handle them and expose them all the way back out to our clients so that everybody knows what's happening. So here's some links. Most of the code that I showed is open source, but that's not actually the point. The point is to think about web services in this sort of compositional manner. And, uh, and of course, the link to the bottom is to the tip docs that have the new 1.3 constate and, and whatnot in them. And uh, I'd be remiss without a word from my sponsors. Um, if you enjoy working on hard engineering problems with many, many thousands of long-lived concurrent connections, come talk with me. Thanks. <laughs>